Hi. Uh, so this lecture will resume our look at social movements and forms of resistance to social inequality, uh, which we started a couple of lectures ago uh, with looking at the labor movement. Uh, in this one, we'll be talking about uh, forms of resistance and social movements um, against uh, global capitalism starting in the 1990s and moving through into the Occupy movement of 2011-2012. So go to the screen share and pull up the PowerPoint. Um, as we've been talking in the last um, two lectures about social movements, uh, which we've defined as collective action and protest for equality that create political possibilities for social reform and justice. So um, in looking at the labor movements and uh, looking at the movements that um, we'll be talking about in this lecture, we see how social movements represent change from the bottom up from a more grassroots, participatory, democratic kind of movement. And that is uh, defined here, quoting as, as organizational structures and strategies that may empower oppressed populations to mount effective challenges and resist the more powerful and advantaged elites. So in the slides ahead, we'll be looking at social movements and global capitalism um, from the 1990s movements against globalization to the Occupy movement of 2011, 2012. Um, we have to go to sort of set the stage back to the larger context of the 1990s um, in which it was widely believed that neoliberal capitalism had triumphed around the world uh, and that this was now the only game in town. Uh, the idea was that communism had fallen in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe uh, in the years between 1989 and 1991. And as a result, there was now no alternative to global capitalism, um, as there had been, you know, during the Cold War, in which there had been this sort of epic battle between capitalism and communism. Uh, so one book um, that's profiled here in the in the slide uh, suggested that we had reached the end of history, um, that this, uh, you know, had the fall of communism had taken us to sort of a new stage in the world um, and in which this this sort of former battle, you know, this this epic worldwide struggle had come to an end. And uh, as a result, global capitalism um, was triumphant all around the world. That was sort of the, the subtext uh, of this book called The End of History by Francis Fukuyama. And the idea was that also, you know, that there was these new technologies, um, especially in communications and, and information that was allowing capitalism to spread around the world and, and integrate, uh, you know, local economies um, across the globe. And that there were also these new free trade agreements uh, like NAFTA, uh, APEC, uh, the free trade uh, agreement on the Americas, that all of these international trade agreements were poised to deregulate and privatize economies even further to sort of create this you know, massive network of, um, of global capitalism. So whereas, you know, the, the, in the 1980s, the, the right wing administrations of of Reagan and Thatcher had been the ones at the at the forefront of spearheading neoliberalism. By the 1990s, that had become really a bipartisan consensus, um, but both political parties on board for this 
larger project of neoliberalism. Uh, in the U.S., the Democratic Party, headed by Bill Clinton at the time, and uh, in the U.K., the Labour Party, headed by Tony Blair at that time, basically accepted these same assumptions, these same premises um, that had, you know, once been, you know, more driven just by the more conservative political parties. Uh, so these basic tenets of neoliberalism like free markets low corporate taxes uh deregulation and privatization uh smaller welfare states uh austerity and budget cuts to public services um all of these things now became a thing that you know was was really a a, a kind of consensus that encompassed uh both you know major political parties so here again, we have this idea of the the end of history as a kind of like um, an end of these uh, larger conflicts and, and a kind of consensus that capitalism uh, ruled. And um, in the 19, second half of the 1990s, we'll see that a number of social movements came, uh, began to uh, as the course of the 1990s went on to kind of chip away at this consensus and, and to challenge this consensus. Um, and, and especially influential sociology text um, that was written during this era uh, by, by a, a Spanish sociologist by the name of Manuel Castells uh, really tried to understand globalization and and what he called the information age as it had been brought about by communications technologies and and what um, Castells called the the network society so he published these this 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 trilogy this this three volume work that he called the information age that looked at different um, dimensions of uh the information age and the, and the network society. So the, the first volume is called The Rise of the Network Society, and it really looks at um, more of the economic factors, uh, the political economy of global capitalism. Volume two, On the Power of Identity, looks at how more like the impacts that this has on uh, people's lives, their, their sense of identity, and also on the social movements um, that in one way or another try to contest this network society. And then volume three called The End of the Millennium that kind of like looks more at the, the, the breakdown of uh, communism and, and the Soviet Union and um, sort of tries to chart the way forward in terms of uh, global capitalism. And uh, in the in the in the second volume of this work, uh, uh, a uh, chapter uh, Castells has a chapter on social movements, in which he examines a very wide range of, of very different social movements, in terms of their collective identity, their opposition to the new global order, and their widely varying goals. So Castells kind of compares these groups, as you see in the in the chart here, that you know otherwise would have little or nothing to do with them. Um, the first of these we'll be talking about uh, the Zapatistas in a couple of slides, basically um, excluded, uh, uh, oppressed uh, indigenous Mexican peoples who rose up against um, global capitalism in the form of NAFTA in, in the form of the North, uh, North American Free Trade Agreement as it was set to take uh, place on uh, January 1st, 1994. Um, and their goal, as it says here, was you know a sense of uh, dignity um, and as well as democracy, uh, uh, democratic governance and power to local communities. 
and also their access to, to land, um, which was very much being threatened by NAFTA and these economic policies that uh, benefited multinational corporations and, and corporations based in the United States, but were very detrimental to uh, workers, uh, to farmers and peasants, um, and uh, also to the environment. Uh, and so they kind of, the Zapatistas, as we'll see, um, helped influence and spearhead like a whole movement uh, that arose in the second half of the 1990s to contest this, these forms of uh, global capitalism. Um, these other movements uh, on, you know, uh, listed here on the, in the table, you know, would otherwise have little or nothing to do with one another. Um, the American militia, um, this uh, Japanese cult group uh, whose name I, I can't pronounce, um, Al Qaeda and the anti-globalization movement. Um, Castells is, you know, taking these as examples of a very different movement, different movements, but in one way or another, they see their adversary as being something similar, you know, whether they understand it as a new world order or uh, a united world government or uh, global corporate capitalism. Uh, in one way or another, they have uh, mobilized against some sense of a, of a global worldwide adversary. Even though they conceptualize, they understand that adversary as being something uh, different, um, there is a, a sense, Castells is arguing here, of commonality in that they have a, 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 an adversary that they perceive to be uh, global or worldwide in some capacity. Um, so the Zapatista uprising that takes place uh, on uh, starting on January 1st, 1994, uh, basically kind of bursts on to uh, international attention. They had uh, named themselves the Zapatista National, National Liberation Army in honor of um, the Mexican Revolution, Emil uh, Mexican revolutionary Emiliano Zapata. And the rebellion begins uh, on this, uh, you know, New Year's Day in 1994 in San Cristobal de la Casas, and uh, in, in Chiapas. And it, it's really in the, the, the actions that they take are in the tradition of a whole history of peasant revolts going back to like the middle ages um, of ransacking town halls and, and burning land deeds. Uh, in this case, the Zapatista rebels destroyed 10 government offices, they freed 179 prisoners, uh, and then attacked an army garrison, and in one town shot down an army helicopter and and then and, and tore down the town hall before quietly slipping back into the jungle. Um, so the Zapatistas kind of represented in some ways something very old um, in terms of indigenous resistance and um, uh, like peasant revolts, uh, the revolts of, of people whose livelihood depended on the land and were having um, that livelihood threatened by economic privatization in one way or another. These are, you know, revolts that are perhaps, you know, a thousand years old. And yet the Zapatistas also did something very new, um, which was to bring to bear the newest, latest communications technologies in order to uh, kind of publicize their actions around the world. Um, and so they were pioneers in using the internet to bring international attention to the movement. And uh, again, the, the timing of this thing was crucial, of, of this uprising was crucial because it sent the message that this was not just a, a rebellion against the Mexican government, but a rebellion against this larger, uh, you know, uh, international free trade uh, agreement of NAFTA, 
that it was a, a kind of a, re a revolt against um, the, the power of global capitalism itself and the way that this free trade agreement was, in, you know, basically rigged to uh, to the benefit of multinational corporations and the and the super wealthy at the expense of everybody else. So, in this in the case of of Chiapas, where this um, rebellion you know sort of took hold, NAFTA was very much perceived um, as a threat to the local economy, um, something that would condemn people to poverty something that would accelerate environmental destruction, uh, something that really um, made a community that was already vulnerable and, and impoverished, um, and to make them even more precarious, and especially by threatening their access to, to land and their ability to sustain a livelihood um, and their ability to um, compete with these multinational corporations um, whose you know cheap imports would would very much like threaten their their livelihood. So so disease, um, in, even enslavement and exploitation had already affected and devastated many of these indigenous communities and and the effects of, of colonization had continued to affect, these uh, Mexican indigenous communities. Uh, these indigenous communities make up about 15% of Mexico's overall population, but in Chiapas, it's more like about one third. And so you have a, a higher concentration of indigenous peoples in this area, this region at, at the very Southern end of, of Mexico. Um, and with that, you know, uh, the state of Chiapas also had one of the highest poverty rates. Um, the people of uh, Chiapas, um, you know, had the, the second highest poverty rate in Mexico. And the people there made up the majority of the 18% of Mexico's population that is living with food insecurity. So this is a place where, you know, poverty and devastation had already been concentrated and they would be made that much more vulnerable by NAFTA um, as so many communities were um, made devastated by um, this free trade agreement. So the Zapatistas begin basically organizing themselves, um, not just within their local communities, but internationally, you know, reaching out to other uh, peasant and and farmers and um, people who uh, whose livelihood was being threatened by these uh, international forces of capitalism, and so they begin to organize what they call these encuentros that uh, attract thousands of people from around the world and become influential on the global anti-capitalist movement. The Zapatista uprising has allowed more than a thousand communities in Chiapas of some three to 400 people to organize federally into 32 autonomous munis municipalities where power lies at the base. So, so basically they kind of uh, have tried to organize this decentralized network of uh, small communities where there is uh, power in the um, decision making of the you know the the people who are part of it, um, so that people who are part of these communities have more of a say and they have more decision making power, and they are able to participate uh, more effectively in these kind of localized autonomous communities. Um, so here local decisions are taken at a local level and, and important decisions are made at a wider regional or municipal level with discussions continuing until something like consensus is reached. So this is an, another important point about the Zapatistas is you know they try to implement a consensus-based decision-making you know, as opposed to just like majority rule 
you try to work towards achieving um, a, a consensus within the local, you know, community decision making uh, process. So in these areas, the people have much more control over their lives than before, and women can play also a much bigger role than traditional society allowed. So the Zapatistas have been not just, you know, this locus of, of resistance to uh, NAFTA and international capitalism at large, but they've also been this kind of model for an alternative form of uh, local democracy and local autonomy and participatory decision-making. So their um, influence would sort of help to, Zapatistas are kind of like the, the opening shot that um, helps to open up a, a new era of global protests uh, people across um, the developing and the developed world who see their their livelihood uh, and their you know entire planet threatened by these forces of global capitalism. So you start to see like you know as it's, it shows here in 1996, um, the the landless people in Brazil uh, begin to organize a movement. Um, against export-driven land reform um, that, again, basically export-driven land reform is going to mean that uh, land is going to end up concentrated in, uh, owned by, you know, a small elite, and you're going to have, you know, huge numbers of people basically um, evicted or, you know, displaced from the land. And so this counter movement begins to build power in Brazil. Um, you get uh, also um, major protests against uh, the global financial institutions that are behind so much of these uh, structural adjustment. Uh, and that is the uh, International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, uh, two global financial institutions I talked more about in the lecture on political economy. Um, suffice it to say that these global financial institutions, um, insofar as they're connected with the, the debt crisis in the developing world, have you know, really had this, um, this power over developing economies to impose austerity and in, to impose all sorts of economic reforms that are you know, favorable to the wealthy and to corporations, but are really detrimental to everyone else. And so we start to see these protests uh, against the IMF and the World Bank um, in African nations, um, spreading to, you know, to Jordan and uh, to South Korea by, you know, the late 1990s. Um, uh, and, you know, also in uh, more developed uh, places like Madrid. And um, also movements against other kinds of free trade agreements like the, the APEC, the Asian Pacific Economic Cooperation, uh, Cooperation Agreement, uh, the, the meetings there in Vancouver. Um, that's the same APEC that's going to be meeting in San Francisco uh, starting um, five days from now I'm, I'm recording this on november 9th 2023 and and apec um will be meeting in san francisco starting on november 14th and there were there were also will also be um protests uh and various acts of civil disobedience and and trying to shut those meetings down um insofar as they're being led by people who are concerned with climate change and and the power of these fossil fuel companies and um, people who are concerned with workers' rights and people who are concerned with with militarism, these uh, agreements and uh, these these meetings of um, you know these these elites from around the world have you know been bringing out uh, social movements and protests and resistance. Um, 
for some time now, going back to the late 1990s. Um, so these, again, these, these movements among uh, farmers and people who are being, uh, who are vulnerable to losing their land uh, and vulnerable to competition from, you know, global food imports and things like that. They began to mobilize uh, in India, in Brazil, in the south of France. Um, all uh, these movements begin to um, also kind of coordinate together in um, the encuentros that the Zapatistas start to, to hold in, in 1996. Um, we also see the protests against the IMF and the World Bank policies beginning to spread here. So many examples um, of ways in which like, uh, instead of the, the end of history, we're beginning to see like the beginning of a new um, resurgence of resistance of people who are most impacted by these uh, global economic forces. And that will kind of um, lead up, I'll lead up to what occurs in the in the streets of Seattle, Washington um, in late 1999, uh, where you have some 35 to 50,000 protesters from a range of different social movements that converge on the meetings of the World Trade Organization uh, to protest um, again, this uh, a kind of like, um, in this case, uh, a, a, a global body that is not really, de you know, democratically accountable to people or to governments at all, and yet has enormous power um, to affect uh, workers' rights, to affect the, the environment, uh, to affect, the, you know, the entire global economy. And so protesters uh, came together in Seattle um, during late 1999 and basically succeeded in, in blocking the opening meeting of these, of these trade ministers that had come from 135 countries and they disrupted all kinds of other WTO functions. The protests intensified the already deep seated internal conflicts among different blocks of countries, leading to a dramatic failure by the WTO to launch a new round of trade talks. Uh, the protesters, uh, the protests also strengthened the bonds of many coalition partners and gave a dramatic boost to a movement that had been steadily growing and gaining clout. So this is, um, you know, a, another kind of momentum builder in this movement that has been, you know, building over the last five years or so. And it was very effective, at least insofar as they um, were able to, you know, shut these meetings down, at least temporarily. Um, and uh, it became, you know, as you see in the in the slide, a, a real battle um, that that erupted in the streets of Seattle. And um, you know, it, it, um, it involved like this very diverse coalition of groups, right? So protesters, you know, dressed themselves up as, as dolphins and, and sea turtles and, and ears of genetically modified corn and, you know, sort of marched through the streets arm in arm with uh, steel workers and tent teamsters and longshore workers. So this, this was a, a very important Thing in itself, this this kind of coalition between labor groups and environmental groups, because you know throughout the 1980s and 90s, these groups had really been kind of at each other's, you know, pitted against each other. Um, you know, whenever you know environmentalists were seen as like job killers, or you know, the the interests of um, workers and environmentalists were often seen as as opposed. And so for them to, you know, come together here in the streets of Seattle was itself a kind of um, a real accomplishment. 
there were also you know religious activists demanding cancellation of poor countries' debt, uh, defenders of human rights in Burma and China. Uh, there were campus crusaders against sweatshops and uh, child labor, uh, eco defenders of old forests, and small farmers from around the world. While some marched or sat down in the streets with arms locked, others danced or acted out street theater dramas. Uh, but whatever their primary issue, protesters made it clear that their ultimate targets were corporate power and the tyranny of the market, which threatened democracy, community, nature, and humanity. They were not against trade, but they wanted the global market to be governed by values beyond profit maximization. So basically the thing that's uniting all of these disparate groups with, you know, very otherwise very different concerns is that they all have this kind of common adversary of the global financial economic order that's coming into being in a way that's you know very uh, undemocratic and not accountable to the people um, who are most being affected by it. And so they come together, these protesters, not to protest uh, a government, but to protest corporate power and the tyranny of the market. Um, and that those protests are met with um, a major uh, uh, reaction on the part of the of the police. So on November 30th, 1999, the opening ceremony at the convention center was officially canceled. Um, and then it took police the whole afternoon and evening to uh, clear the streets. Uh, the Seattle mayor declared a state of emergency. Uh, imposed a curfew and uh, then cut off this whole uh, 50 block part of the city and declared it to be a no protest zone. So in, in response, basically, to these protests in the streets, um, the mayor of Seattle kind of <laughs> basically like overrode everybody's right to assembly and created this whole kind of, you know, insular kind of zone where uh, these, you know, trade ministers could be free from being harassed by protesters or something. And uh, then the governor of Washington called in two battalions of the Army National Guardsmen, all kinds of other law enforcement agencies sent support. The troop, troops and officers lined the perimeter of the no protest zone. The police surrounded and arrested several groups of would-be bystanders, uh, protesters and bystanders. And police called in from other cities, uh, generally mistook the typically crowded streets of Capitol Hills as uh, groups of protesters. More than 500 people were jailed. Throughout the day, the police used tear gas to disperse crowds downtown although a permitted demonstration organized by the Steelworkers Union was held along the war waterfront. So basically we just see, um, as we've seen with the history of the labor movement, this massive police presence to protect uh, property uh, over people. So, um, here again, we, we see things beginning to intensify, uh, continuing to intensify in the early 2000s with, you know, um, on the heels of this protest against the WTO. Um, there are um, protests against the IMF and the World Bank in Washington, D.C. Uh, we see protesters clashing with police in Prague uh, during IMF. Uh, during an IMF and World Bank summit. We see major protests and strikes against the IMF and the World Bank policies in Argentina, Ecuador, Costa Rica, Bolivia, Kenya, South Africa, India, Haiti, Nigeria, Paraguay, and many other countries. So this is increasingly becoming a, a real global movement. Um, 
we see uh, 25 people, 25,000 people protesting the Summit of the Americas conference in Quebec City, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, we see uh, riots in Sweden at the EU summit where more than a thousand people are arrested and three people are shot by the police. Uh, we see a, another massive protest in, in Genoa uh, where one person is shot and uh, killed by the police. So this is a, a movement that, you know, just as capitalism um, is becoming more globally integrated. So is this uh, counter social movement becoming more globally integrated and connected with one another. And in both cases, um, it has in large part to do with these, you know, communications technologies that are coming about that make it easier for um, both capitalists and uh, protesters to communicate uh, internationally, you know, a, a around the world. Um, an important person to who comes across to, to chronicle these movements, um, this guy by the name of David Graeber, uh, who died a couple of years ago, um, who was an, uh, an anthropologist and also an activist who was uh, connect, connected with these, like kind of more, the more of the anarchist kind of movements that were uh, coming about at these times. Um, he wrote a number of books and was widely considered one of the most influential intellectuals of, the, uh, of, of our time. And he's been credited um, with creating the slogan, we are the 99%, during Occupy Wall Street, as we'll talk about in a minute. Um, in the Age of Inequality, uh, you may notice that he had a short article called The Wall, Wall Done, um, which was basically a journalistic account of anti-globalization protests in, 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 and especially the, the free trade um, uh, summit in Quebec City during 2001. And um, out of that, um, reportage and, and ethnographic work, he comes out with this book called Direct Action, which was really the, the first detailed ethnographic study of the global justice movement that utilized methods of participant observation, you know, where the person, participant observation being, you know, a method where the person is not just a, a observing a larger phenomenon, but also a participant in it. And he was, you know, working on the assumption that a disinterested or objective perspective on these issues was impossible. Um, and so therefore, Graeber is fairly unique in the sense that he wrote as somebody who was both a scholar and an activist at the, at the same time. Um, the case study at the center of this book is the uh, organizing and the events that led to the drum dramatic protests against the Summit of the Americas in Quebec City in 2001. Uh, Graeber's ethnographic study described events ranging from informal conversations in coffee shops to large uh, spokes council planning meetings and street actions. This is, this is what makes this a really interesting read is it, it gives you this kind of like you are there kind of quality to it. Um, he really captures uh, what these meetings are like and what the concerns of the activists are and the conversations that they're having and um, how they, you know, come about the, the sort of tactics and tactics and, and strategies that they use. Um, it's really a kind of work um, that is in like the best tradition of anthropology, which is to take, you know, to look at a group and its culture and to study its, you know, how it makes sense of the world and the rituals or symbols that are important to it. Um, he takes those kind of anthropological methods and applies them to studying these um, groups of uh, protesters, these, these movements, 
uh, in a way that's, that's, that's very unique and, and very interesting and, and makes direct action a really good book. Uh, Graver's study addresses these matters of deep interest to anthropology as they pertain to this social movement. Um, so their meeting structure and process, their language, their symbolism, their representation, um, and the specific rituals of activist culture. So again, he, he kind of applies these, these methods that come from anthropology as a social science and applies them to trying to understand these movements um, where again, he's not just like an observer, but he's also somebody who's part of it, who's a participant. Um, now, the dramatic shift, of course, that happens in 2001 um, is, you know, the 9-11 terrorist attacks, uh, you know, on September 11th. And that has an immediate impact of um, contracting the possibilities and opportunities for political dissent. Um, the reaction to 9-11 was, you know, very much to curtail people's civil liberties, uh, to curtail um, people's, you know, right to travel and, um, you know, to, to kind of cut down on on all kinds of uh, freedoms that, you know, people had been, you know, exercising uh, in their right to protest. And then it creates this kind of like atmosphere of, of patriotism and fear. Um, and so it really kind of strangles the, the possibility um, and, and shuts, you know, a lot of this movement um, is, is kind of squashed and then, will become kind of redirected because of course, in reaction to uh, the events of 9-11, the United States starts mobilizing for war, um, first in Afghanistan and then in Iraq uh, in 2003. And so this movement kind of shifts focus more towards protesting um, like US empire and militarism. So on February 15th, 2003, you see protests involving somewhere between 15 to 30 million people that took to the streets to protest the impending US war with Iraq, uh, the largest day of anti-war protests in world history. Um, the demonstration of some 3 million people in Rome is recorded as the largest anti-war protest ever. So there's this huge mass mobilization again um, around the world um, to what the United States is going to do uh, in Iraq um, starting in March of 2003. Um, now to look at um, the movement that begins at the end of the 2000s or, you know, around 2010, 2011 with uh, Occupy and, and the sort of global democratic movements, um, we have to situate these within the financial crisis that occurs uh, starting in 2007 uh, and really kind of peaks in 2008. This is a severe worldwide economic crisis, the most severe really since the Great Depression of the 1930s. Um, it, it's rooted in uh, predatory lending practices that target low income home buyers um, that uh, involve excessive risk taking by global financial institutions. And uh, the eventually this US, like the, the, the housing, uh, speculation and, and the so-called bubble bursts in the United States. All of this, you know, is a kind of a perfect storm of economic um, conditions that will have immensely um, devastating impacts, not on the people who started the crisis, but on, you know, uh, more ordinary citizens. So the crisis that 
sparks this great recession results in increasing unemployment and uh, suicide. Uh, it leads to the decrease in institutional trust uh, in, among other metrics. And millions of people lost their jobs and their savings, uh, saw their homes foreclosed upon. Um, again, as just as we've learned from looking at historical incidents of economic crisis, the people that end up paying for uh, these financial meltdowns are certainly not the people that are responsible for starting the financial meltdowns. And so at the onset of the crisis, the government deploys these massive bailouts of the financial institutions and used its monetary and physical policies to prevent a collapse of the global financial system. So the, the banks get basically, you know, bailed out. Um, and then the people who, but not the people whose like homes are foreclosed upon or people who lose their jobs. There's no bailout for the people. There's a bailout for these financial institutions who uh, ironically and tragically enough, are the very ones that started this crisis to begin with. Um, so this whole idea of the neoliberal economic model, you know, that had presumed to be so triumphant and unquestioned as recently as the 1990s, had suddenly loses all sorts of ideological legitimacy. Um, and this whole kind of model uh, begins to collapse and, and would have collapsed uh, even further if not for the huge government bailouts. So that's kind of sets the stage <clears throat> for a new wave of popular democratic social movements that begin sweeping the world uh, in 2010 and 2011. And, and here we begin um, with the Arab Spring uh, that begins with a revolution in Tunisia in 2010 that is in response to corruption and economic st stagnation. Um, from Tunisia, this protest then spread to Libya, Egypt, Yemen, Syria, and Bahrain. Um, and so this is uh, at, what, at which point it comes to be known as like the, the Arab Spring because of its uh, spread through the Middle Eastern world. And uh, so rulers here are deposed or there are major uprisings and social violence, including uh, riots, uh, civil wars, insurgencies, um, all of this begins to spread. And then we begin to see um, its counterpart part in terms of democratic movements in Europe beginning to spread with the, the Indignados movement, which was a series of protests, demonstrations, and occupations against austerity policies in Spain that began to spread around the world uh, the, you know, with the, the local and regional elections of 2011 and 2012. So the movement transferred to Europe the model of the protest camp, which had formed in the Arab Spring and adapted it to a more countercultural framework, uh, begin somewhere between six and a half to eight million Spaniards, Spaniards participated in these events. So the, 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 this, in other words, this kind of like this model of these mass assemblies of people in the streets who are trying to, you know, democratically take back you know, decision-making and, and take back their society. And they're holding these huge assemblies that are kind of supposed to be a like a kind of a model of that kind of democracy in action, a, a model of the kind of world that they want to put into being. These uh, forms of popular assembly kind of, you know, had um, been created, you know, during this Arab spring and then are quickly adapted you know, by other peoples around the world. And, and so again, it's, it's a testament to the, the power of these communications technologies. I mean, people are finding out about 
these protests in the Arab world through, you know, uh, Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and, you know, all of these social media platforms that, you know, had become available, you know, on a widespread basis just a few years previously. So this is, these technologies are having um, uh, an important impact in spreading the, the social movement activity at, at, a, at an accelerated rate. And so the, this is, leads then to the formation of the Occupy movement in the United States, the uh, Occupy Wall Street. Uh, was a movement against economic inequality that began in, in Zuccotti Park um, near Wall Street and, and New York's financial district in uh, 2000, September 2011. Um, the call, uh, the, the protest was initially um, called for by the Canadian anti-consumerist magazine called Adbusters. And uh, they, uh, Occupy Wall Street, basically raised numerous interconnected issues that were related to economic inequality, corporate power, uh, and the influence of money in government. So um, Occupy was kind of a, uh, again, a coalition of various groups that had, you know, different concerns but they're all kind of centered around these economic questions of inequality, the power of corporations, the power that wealthy people have over the government. Um, all of these were you know, interconnected insofar as they uh, were you know, looking at the adversary of uh, international capitalism and its uh, power over the so-called 99%. Um, so this is the, where the slogan, we are the 99% comes from uh, in reference to these inequalities in the US between the wealthiest 1% and the rest of the population. So this is what made this a very effective slogan um, was that it kind of, showed or it encapsulated the way that the world had been dividing uh, along these class lines and um, sort of tried to form an enormous democratic coalition of the 99% in opposition to the increasing wealth and power of the 1%. So Again, protesters are using these kind of consensus-based decision-making processes in these massive, you know, general assemblies that would form um, in the streets and in in New York and in Zuccotti Park. <clears throat> and so, you know, there's this attempt to, um, you know, create a democratic society and to kind of model that democracy in these uh, general assemblies and these, um, you know, the, these very, you know, long meetings where people would try to arrive at consensus and, you know, to, to try to involve as much as possible, you know, everyone's voice in uh, the decision-making process. In general, Occupy Wall Street uh, emphasized redress through direct action rather than petitioning to authorities with demands. Um, so they were kind of uh, famously or infamously reluctant to make, to state any, you know, uh, like demands in terms of what they wanted. Um, so they're more likely to um, take forms of direct action uh, rather than, you know, uh, asking or demanding that uh, authorities or elites, you know, take certain kinds of steps towards reform. <clears throat> um, the Occupy movement begins uh, to go, you know, it's, it sort of begins in September of 2011, but <clears throat> it really kind of takes off with a with a viral video of police violence 
uh, in which basically the police had had arrested um, a group of people who were marching through the financial district in New York, and they had kind of kettled them off. And in the video, you see a police sergeant come by and and mace a couple of women in the face. Um, you know, basically sprayed mace right into their face, and they weren't doing anything. Um, and that video kind of goes goes viral um on you know on youtube and um on social media and so again technology is 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 a real important factor here in the way that it allows these these movements to organize um you know and and to spread the word in in an international you know kind of context so um that movement spreads very quickly, as you know, we've seen in in looking at the labor history, you know how much like police violence, <clears throat> as I've said, just you know, you typically throws gasoline on a fire, and causes that uh, protest and rage to spread even further. <clears throat> so then, in October of 2011 is when this movement really begins to spread. Um, on October 1st, more than 500 protesters are arrested during a march across the Brooklyn Bridge. <clears throat> there are also these huge marches that take place in Chicago, Boston, Los Angeles. Um, by the following week, Occupy protests had taken place or were ongoing in over 951 cities across 82 countries and in over 600 communities in the United States. <clears throat> it's kind of amazing to see how fast um, and how widely this movement spread within just a matter of a couple of weeks. And again, a, a, a testament to the way in which people were able to use these technologies and social media to spread the word. And so uh, I, just remember at that time, you know, people were just kind of, um, everyone was kind of saying like, you know, it's about time, it's about time, it's about time that like people had been waiting, you know, and, and had been, you know, discontent for, for years and years and years. And then finally there was this movement that was, you know, saying what they would, you know, millions of people had been feeling, but didn't feel you know, uh, powerful enough to do anything about. And so when Occupy um, starts to, to happen, it, there's this, it, it grows very quickly because it's um, tapping into a, a very deep-seated discontent that was shared by millions of people around the world. So although the movement was most active in the United States, um, by October uh, of 2011, these protests and occupations had started in dozens of other countries um, involving every continent except Antarct Antarctica. So this becomes a, um, a, a truly global movement um, within a matter of weeks. In uh, Oakland, here in the Bay Area, um, Occupy Oakland uh, begins um, with a rally attended by hundreds of supporters held in tandem with Indigenous Peoples Day on um, October 10th, 2011. And so the protesters basically set up tents uh, that evening in Fr uh, Frank Agawa Plaza, which they then renamed uh, Oscar Grant Plaza in memory of the young black man who was, who was killed by uh, BART police uh, earlier that year. And um, some two weeks later, they're uh, marching through the city um, and they go back to Frank Agawa Plaza uh, only to find that the police have issued a dispersal order. Um, this fails to move the crowd. And so then there's this 
this melee that happens and the, and the police start firing tear gas and um, shooting, you know, like bean bags at the, at the crowd. And uh, one guy who's there named Scott Olson, who was a, a former Marine and a, and a veteran of the Iraq war <clears throat> almost has his head blown off. Um, it basically suffers a, a skull fracture caused by a shooting projectile. Um, so a, a tear gas or smoke canister that was fired by the police. <clears throat> and the, the video of that shooting again goes viral. So again, you know, as we've seen with other instances, um, this uh, dramatization of police violence against protesters has the effect of, of mobilizing people even further. So um, in response to these events, uh, Occupy Oakland calls for a general strike uh, on November 2nd, 2011. Tens of thousands of protesters gathered to participate in rallies, marches, and teach-ins that were designed to empower citizens and to gather to draw attention to economic inequality and corporate greed. Um, there's a march to the port of Oakland that drew uh, something like 100,000 protesters um, as part of that um, uh, uh, general strike. The port of Oakland was basically shut down for that day. Um, you see uh, here in the picture on the slide uh, the immense uh, size of this uh, of this movement as they're marching um, around the port of Oakland. Um, basically, this this movement will be put out with uh, will be put down with a. Um, a coordinated effort of uh, police repression. So in November uh, of 2011, the NYPD kind of swoops into Zuccotti Park in riot gear uh, in the early morning and basically starts, you know, removing and arresting um, demonstrators. Uh, they make more than 200 arrests that morning um, the previous uh, day, the Oakland police had started to do the same thing in clearing out uh, Oscar Grant Plaza. The movement was basically left with no physical presence uh, by that time at the end of that week. Um, in UC Dave at UC Davis, um, is this this infamous incident that's shown pictured here in the slide uh, happens where a university police uh, pepper sprayed a group of demonstrators as they were seated on a paved path in the campus quad um, engaging you know in nonviolent civil disobedience and again that video uh, spread around the world as a as a viral video and and the, and the photograph became a kind of internet meme. Um, so there's basically this, in this period in November of 2011, there's this kind of, you know, across the country, there's this coordinated campaign to clear out these um, Occupy camps. Um, and, you know, this, this, this goes, uh, encompasses cities across the country um, by, the end of 2011, they had cleared most of the major camps, the last remaining ones in Washington, D.C. and London um, had been evicted by February 2012. So to wrap up, um, we want to think about a couple of <clears throat> texts that have tried to make sense of this latter wave of protests that have come about since. Um, one is a, a book by a BBC journalist named Paul Mason, who published a book called Why It's Still Kicking Off Everywhere in 2012. And the book includes coverage of uh, this 2011-2012 wave of revolt and revolution around the world. He talks about uh, riots in Athens, Greece, uh, student occupations in the UK, uh, Quebec and Mexico, 
and then finally covers the, the emergence of the Occupy movement and the revolutions of the Arab Spring. And so much like Castells had done back in the 90s, he tries to find um, some common factors, some larger sociological factors to explain the rise of these social movements. And he comes up with basically three factors. One is the collapse of this neoliberal economic model, uh, the way that the economic collapse had hit young people especially hard, leaving them with few job opportunities and increasing student debt. Um, the hypocrisy of neoliberalism was on full display when banks and other financial institutions received a government bailout. So like one popular chant uh, during Occupy Wall Street was to say, you know, the, the banks got sold out, uh, the banks got bailed out and we got sold out. So this sort of hypocrisy um, and the way in which like this economic collapse had, you know, been hitting young people, especially hard. Um, and, you know, so a lot of young people, you know, a lot of who was involved in like the Occupy protests were like young people who were, you know, a few years out of college and were, you know, still kind of trapped in dead end jobs and um, had, you know, a lot of student debt um, and not a lot of opportunity looking forward. And so that those, that sort of group of people, you know, made up uh, a lot of the, the, the troops of, of Occupy. Um, the second factor that Mason identifies is, is this revolution in technology. Uh, the way that it created, in his words, horizontal social networks for activism and protest. Uh, those social movements, these technological changes in communication and information have surpassed the traditional means of disseminating ideology that persisted during the previous two centuries. And then finally, he focuses on what he calls a change in human consciousness resulting from what Castells had called a networked individual. That is an expansion of the space and power of individual human beings and, change, and a change in the way they think, a, ch a change in the rate of uh, uh, change in, of, of ideas, an expansion of available knowledge and a massive revolution in culture. So again, like Castells had talked about in his books on the information age, the, their, these economic and technological changes come together to produce uh, a change in culture, a, ch a change in consciousness, a, a new kind of individual. And uh, Mason believes that that's especially apparent um, in the younger generations and that that's why the, the younger generations are kind of leading these these kinds of protests and and why they're able to use you know the new technologies that much more effectively in order to uh, transmit the messages and you know help videos go viral and create memes and you know all the ways in which like they uh, were able to use technology very effectively for the purposes of organizing and mobilizing these movements. Um, Castells also has written a, a, a later book um, about these events uh, called uh, Networks of Outrage and Hope. Um, so, you know, notice that again, he, he's using this, this idea of networks um, as a way of talking about um, uh, technological changes and the, the information age and, and you know, now the, the internet age. And so in this more recent book, Castells examines uh, the protests and, and movements of 2011, 2012. That is, you know, again, the, the Arab uprisings, the Indignadas movement in Spain, Occupy Wall Street, um, all these movements that you know, I mentioned in the previous slides, uh, plus social protests in Turkey and Brazil. And he has a number of, of case studies that he examines <laughs> and 
in looking at these case studies and, and kind of comparing them and trying to draw conclusions, he basically zeroes in on, on two common factors. One being a fundamental crisis of legitimacy of the political system, regard, regardless of the form of, or, of the political regime. So one thing that, you know, is, is common <laughs> around the world and increasingly common is that political mainstream political parties are despised in most countries. Uh, government corruption is widespread and is a kind of recurrent theme. So these institutions have kind of lost legitimacy and people are more inclined as a result to take it to the streets, um, to realize that like, if they want a democratic society, they have to do it themselves. Um, that they can't really depend on politicians and elites uh, to be leaders in creating the kind of society that they want. Um, that these movements, uh, you know, are only have themselves. So all these movements uh, were formed through autonomous communicative capacity. That is, they were able to connect via the new social media mediated by smartphones and communications networks. So again, um, the emphasis on um, technology and the way that these uh, forms of communication technology enable uh, these kinds of movements. So Castells points to multiple ways that social movements are networked through communications technologies. Although movements may start with the internet social act networks, they become a movement by occupying urban space, standing occupation of public squares or the persistence of street demonstrations. <clears throat> so there's this like combination of like cyberspace and urban space, you know, and so movements, you know, can't become movements just simply on the internet. They have to kind of manifest themselves in public space. Um, and, you know, this is, again, a thing we see, whether we're talking about, you know, uh, Egypt or we're talking about, uh, you know, Wall Street. Um, this is the these occupations of public space and of uh, urban, um, the urban environment to hold general assemblies, uh, demonstrations, rallies and so forth. Castells also talks about how movements are local and global at the same time. That is that they start in specific contexts for their own reasons. They build their own networks and construct their public space by occupying urban space and connecting to the internet networks. <clears throat> but they're also global um, because they are connected throughout the world and learn from other movements internationally. So again, there's this necessary connection between the local and the global levels um, in the formation of these movements. These movements, he says, are usually spontaneous in their origin. <clears throat> They're often triggered by a spark of indignation, either related to a specific event, such as police brutality, as we've seen in, in many instances, or a peak of disgust with the actions of the rulers. The movements go viral following the logic of the internet networks. So this whole idea of going, going viral um, is something that, you know, follows the, the, the logic of the technology. The transition from outrage to hope is accomplished in the space of autonomy. Decision-making typically occurs in popular assemblies or committees formed in the assemblies. These are usually, although not always, leaderless movements. So that's, you know, the, the title of the book is Networks of Outrage and Hope. And Castells tries to kind of end it um, by looking at sources of hope or, you know, to end it on, on a note of optimism. And, and where he finds the hope is in these uh, kind of spontaneous, decentralized, autonomous democratic communities and these assemblies that, you know, spark up uh, in urban space and that 
are kind of a model of a more democratic society, which in which uh, people have a greater voice and are more able to participate in the decisions that affect their lives. So um, we'll be kind of circling back to some of these insights <clears throat> with the last lecture um, in which we'll be looking at social movements um, uh, related to Black Lives Matter. And, uh, you know, we'll kind of go back in that lecture to, you know, all the way to the history of like the Black Panther Party, but then to bring it forward to looking at um, the Black Lives Matter protests that have occurred, you know, in, in the last several years. Okay, so with that, I will stop the share and um, bid you a good day. Thanks.